because from cover to cover I can show you that God wants us to be bold and courageous and he wants us to be confrontational when we need to be confrontational he wants us to take new ground he doesn't want us to be afraid of the enemy he wants us to exercise authority and he wants us to do great things in our lives this weekend I'm going to do a series called the fearsome four because I think that there are certain things that really have a tendency to be used by Satan to try to really make us miserable and destroy our lives. And so I'm going to teach you on four different things this weekend. Fear, worry, guilt, and insecurity. Fear, worry, guilt, and insecurity. And I believe that fear is involved in every single one of them. Of course, fear is involved in fear. But worry is just the fear that our needs are not going to be met. That we're going to have lack in our life and have an unsolved problem. Guilt is fear that whatever we've done wrong is something that we cannot overcome and it's going to affect us and we're going to have to deal with it the rest of our lives. And insecurity is just a fear that we're not okay. We don't measure up to what we feel that we should be or the message that the world has given us that we should be. I'm going to start tonight talking to you about fear, but each one of these, I want to talk to you about how your mind affects you in all of them. Your mind is certainly involved in worry. The mind is involved in fear, in guilt, in insecurity. Insecurity is just a result of how you see yourself, how you look at yourself, what you think about yourself. Really, there's no message that we could teach in the Word of God that we wouldn't have to bring the mind into. The Bible says some amazing things about the mind. And I think one of the reasons why people respond so well to books and teaching resources about the mind is because everybody knows that the mind just seems to give us continual trouble. If you don't have peace of mind, then you're just, just absolutely miserable. Proverbs 23, 7 says, as a man thinks, so is he. I've kind of put my own little phrase of way of saying that, and I just say, where the mind goes, the man follows. Where your thoughts go, that's where you end up going. As you think, that's the way you will end up being. So it's no wonder that the Bible teaches us that we must learn how to meditate on the Word of God Roll it over and over and over in your mind until it becomes a part of you. Meditation takes information and turns it into revelation. One of the problems I think that we can have as Christians is there's so much information available today that we can get stuck at information and never really study any one thing long enough for it to become revelation. And it's not information that sets you free. It's revelation. It's not what somebody else knows that's going to help you. It's what you know. And it's not even just what you know. It's what you know that you know that you know that you know that you know. The kind of revelation knowledge that Satan cannot steal from you with his lies. Romans 12 is a wonderful group of scriptures but verse 2 says, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed, entirely changed by the complete renewal of your mind. Now, every one of these problems that we're going to talk about this weekend can be let in or kept out by right or wrong thoughts. You can open your mind to fear and let it in, or you can close your mind to fear and not let it in. I think the mind is kind of like a, a doorway. And we have to learn how, when the enemy tries to sneak in with a thought that's going to be detrimental to us or against the Word of God, we need to learn how to close our mind against that and say, no. No is a great word for Christians to learn. 2 Timothy 2.23 backs this principle up. And I want you to look at this scripture here on the, the screen, or if you're quick in your Bible, you can... 
open it up. It, but what, look at this in the Amplified Bible. It says, refuse, shut your mind against. Have nothing to do with trifling, ill-informed, unedifying, stupid controversies over ignorant questions. For you know they foster strife and breed quarrels. Now in this particular group of scriptures, the Apostle Paul is talking about the need to live in peace and to keep strife out of your life. And one of the ways that we get into strife is by getting into conversations with people that nobody really knows anything about, but everybody thinks they know everything about. And so then you start bickering back and forth and having problems. So he's basically saying there, the minute that starts, you shut your mind against it and have nothing to do with it. I have saved myself and my husband so many arguments in our home since I have learned how to do that. Years ago, I would say something, and he'd say something, then I'd say something, and he'd say something. And of course, you know, being different, we probably a good part of the time have different opinions about things. He'll say something, I'll say something, he'll say something, I'll say something. Dave was trying on some jackets for me last week and I told him that I'd like to see him start maybe wearing some, some jackets again to some of the meetings. So he was trying on these jackets that he has and there was only one of them that I didn't like, but he liked it. And I said, I'm not really crazy about that one. I think it's too short. He said, that's style. Everything that I don't like that he likes, he says it's style. Now, I don't know why he knows so much about style, but here's the thing. 15 years ago, we would have had an argument over that. Now, when it gets to that point, I just shut my mind to it, and I just say, okay. Do what you want to with it. And I go on. You can open your mind to things, and you can shut your mind to things. You can shut your mind to gossip. You can walk away from it and say, I'm not going to listen to that. I don't want to hear it. You don't have to just let anything in your mind that wants to come in there. You can shut your mind to stuff that's going to be poisonous. Somebody at work is trying to, you know, a lot of people at work maybe are saying, oh, have you heard, you know, there's a rumor that, you know, the company may close and, you know, then what are we going to do? Well, you can just shut your mind to that because here's the bottom line. If it closes, it closes. And if it don't, it don't. And so if you're trusting God, you don't, there's no need for you to be afraid it's going to close from now until the time it closes. So you might as well just not get into that and go ahead and trust God. And if you'll do that, then if anybody's kept, it may be you. And if nobody's kept, then God will make sure that you get another job. You don't have to get into all that stuff. You have to be very careful about what you let get into your mind. But at the same time, I think that we should open our mind to some things. I believe that we should be single-minded, but not narrow-minded. There's a man in the Bible in John chapter 1, verse 45. I'm going to take a look at it for a minute. That Jesus had some very complimentary things to say about him. Philip sought and found Nathanael and told him, we found and discovered the one, talking about Jesus, Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote about, Jesus from Nazareth, the legal son of Joseph. Nathanael answered him, Nazareth? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Now, how many of you can see right there that he already had an opinion? Nazareth wasn't a very great place. There was a lot of talk about Nazareth. So he already had a, he just had an opinion that Nazareth was not a very good place. And so how could anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip said, well, come and see. And Jesus saw Nathanael coming, which means he did come to see. And he said concerning him, see, here's an Israelite indeed, a true descendant of Jacob, in whom there is no guile, nor deceit, nor falsehood, nor duplicity. Now, he said a lot of good things about Nathaniel, and I don't know the foundation of all of them, but as I was studying that many years ago, one of the things that I felt like God showed me is that one of the reasons why Jesus liked Nathaniel so much was because even though he had a preconceived opinion that nothing good could come out of Nazareth, especially not the Savior, he was open-minded enough and humble enough to at least go see. And I think a lot of people would get a lot further in their walk with God if they wouldn't have so many preconceived ideas because this is what 
your denomination believes, and well, this is what your denomination believes, and well, this is what your denomination believes, and well, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a this or that type of religion, and we don't believe that. Well, does anybody ever take the time to look at the Bible? Because that's what we really have to all believe, is the Word of God. And I know that different people put different, you know, interpretations on it, but there's some things that you can't miss. I mean, I'll just give you a few examples. Like, you, you might say, well, you know, I don't believe in tithing. Well, you could not read your Bible and not believe in tithing. So if you don't believe in tithing, it's probably just because you don't want to tithe. Or you might say, well, I don't, I don't believe in speaking in tongues. Ooh, weird people do that. Ooh, that stuff's from the devil. And you hear about, oh, that went away with the early church. See, those are things that people have heard, and so they spend all their life believing that. And if they're narrow-minded and won't check it out for themselves, then they can miss great blessings that God has for them. But somebody says, well, bless God. I don't believe in that laying on hands for healing. I don't believe in that stuff. Well, you know, if you get sick enough, you might change your mind. But, you know, you probably should read your Bible. How many of you are with me tonight? Don't just, don't just be bullheaded and, and not be open to letting God teach you and to learn. It's amazing what we could learn from everybody we're around if we didn't already think that we knew it all. You've got to be very careful about what comes in to your mind. Fear in particular, I believe, enters our life in the form of a thought, and then it creates emotions. And sometimes I think that the thoughts, although they're hard to deal with, are easier to deal with than the emotions. Because we are very feeling driven. And fear is a very strong, can be a very strong, intense feeling that tries to move us to either take some kind of foolish, ridiculous action, or it tries to prevent us from taking an action that would be a good and a godly action. There were probably even people in here tonight that when it, when it was offering time, you might have initially felt in your heart that you were to give a certain thing and then you thought about it. And then you thought about what you're going to have to give up if you did. And then fear came. And so you went ahead and did something that was just comfortable. We all go through that. Everybody goes through that. I mean, there's still times in my life when God will ask me to give something or do something. And I mean, I've got enough experience now with God that, that I know pretty much when he's asking me to do something. But still, if he asks me to do something that I don't really want to do, if I think about it too long, then fear can begin to get in there about what kind of sacrifice I'm going to make and what I'm going to have to, to do without. If we can ever learn to not let fear rule our lives, we're going to be 250% better off. I'm not going to stand here and tell you that I've got a message tonight that can keep you from ever feeling fear. I believe that there will be times in our lives when we will feel fear because I believe that that is the master spirit that Satan uses against people. I believe probably more than any other thing he uses fear because fear is the opposite of faith. God wants us to walk in faith. Satan wants us to walk in fear. You have to be very careful about saying things like, I'm just so afraid my kids are going to get in trouble. I'm just so afraid my kids are going to get in, get in trouble. I'm so afraid my kids are going to get on drugs. I'm so afraid my kids, I'm, I'm afraid my kids, I'm afraid my kids. Don't say things like that. Job said in Job 3.25, what we greatly fear comes upon us. Now, I don't think that every time you have a little fear that's presented to your mind, that that means that that thing is going to happen in your life. But if you get a great fear in your life, and it's something that you meditate on over and over, and you begin to speak it, I think you are putting yourself in danger of opening a door to have that thing in your life. Not just you, but me. We need to be very careful about our thoughts and our words. And we need to keep our minds set in the right direction. And the only acceptable attitude that a Christian can have toward fear, the only thought that we can think, the only words that we can say where fear is concerned is simply, I will not fear because God is with me. And if you have a problem with fear, with excessive timidity, with cowardice, even extreme shyness, I think there's some things that people just accept as their personality when really it's the devil just trying to take advantage of you. 
There are people that are more naturally bold and some that are more naturally shy than others. But if you're so shy that you can't participate in life and you can't participate in a conversation and you won't really speak your heart and speak your mind sometimes, even when you know God is trying to get you to, you're afraid to try things new. You're kind of like on the outside of life looking in and it's time for you to come against that thing and say, no, that's not the real me. That's not the way that God wants me to be. That's not the way he created me to be. Because from cover to cover, I can show you that God wants us to be bold and courageous. And he wants us to be confrontational when we need to be confrontational. He wants us to take new ground. He doesn't want us to be afraid of the enemy. He wants us to exercise authority. And he wants us to do great things in our life. Every single one of us. Every single one of us. Not just whoever's up here on the platform. Every single one of us. And you're never going to be happy if you don't fulfill your potential. So many people just feel frustrated because they, they, they know that they're not really doing what they're meant to do. And I'm just, you know, I just, I'm just waiting for God to show me what the call is on my life. Well, if you listen to me tonight, you don't have to wait one more day. You know why? Because you can start stepping out and finding out. It don't take very long at all when you start stepping out. You'll step out into a few things and think, whoop, that ain't it. Now, I'm not suggesting being foolish and stupid, but, you know, when I was a young Christian and I wanted to be used by God, I mean, any opportunity that came along at my church to do something, I'd step out and try it. And a lot of it didn't work. I mean, I tried doing some things, and I just thought, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't, ugh, ugh, I don't like that. <laughs> I even tried working in the nursery, taking care of the babies, and me and the babies knew that wasn't right. <laughs> that lasted about three weeks. I went out on the streets and tried to pass out tracks, and I did it, but I didn't like it. It was very uncomfortable for me, and yet I know people that can do street evangelism, and they just, they just love it. You know, God, you're not, you can't drive a parked car. Some of you need to get your life out of park. And you need to put God in the driver's seat. And you, you need to stop being afraid, 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 afraid that if you take a step without three prophecies and two angel appearances. <laughs> if you really want to be used by God, then ask yourself, what do I like? What do, enjoy? What do I enjoy? I love to talk. And it didn't take me very long when I started talking to find out this is it. This is what I'm supposed to be doing. It's not the nursery. It's not street evangelism. I'm going to tell everybody else what to do. And I like that too. I always have. And what you do doesn't have to be like what somebody else is doing. Maybe you're great at, at baking. Maybe you're great at encouraging people. Maybe you're a great person in prayer. All you have to do is find what you're good at and you need to start doing it and you need to start doing without apology. We are going to have a good time this weekend. Amen. I hate fear. I absolutely hate what fear does to people. And I think that I could even go so far as to say that I believe if we let fear stay in our lives and we don't confront it, that it's sin. Because Romans 14, 23 says, whatever is not of faith is sin. So worry is sin. <laughs> guilt is sin. You can't be guilty by faith. You don't worry by faith. You can't have fear by faith. And that helps me sometimes to get some things straightened out in my life. When I go back to Romans 14, 23 and see, hey, you know what, Joyce? This attitude you've got is not faith. And so it's not just a little oops. It's not a little problem. It's not your personality. It's offensive to God because without faith, we cannot please God. And those that come to him must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. We need to learn how to live from faith to faith, not from faith to doubt and unbelief to doubt and unbelief and more doubt and unbelief and then a little more faith and then back to doubt and unbelief. How do you see yourself? 
fearful and timid or courageous and bold? <laughs> capable or incapable? Able or unable? Strong or weak? Above or under? A conqueror or conquered? A victor or a victim? Some people have a victim mentality and they spend their whole life trying to get over what happened to them way back here somewhere and that's all they ever talk about and that's all their life ever is and I know all about being a victim but I also know that you can totally and completely recover and you can go on with your life because when you are in Christ you are a new creature in him <laughs> old things pass away and all things become brand new I think one of our biggest problems and I really believe this is we still battle with seeing ourselves properly. We have to learn how to see ourselves not in ourselves but in Christ. The number one need that we have is to know God and the number two need that we have is to know who we are in Christ. Once you really begin to know who you are in Christ everything begins to change and I'm going to be talking to you about that quite a bit this weekend because I think that's a that's a desperate need that we have until I began to know who I was in Christ and what that really simply means is until I began to believe what the Bible said about me rather than the way I felt or how I thought or what other people said to me see if you just believe what other people say to you about you it may not always be good matter of fact I can pretty much promise you that it won't be you can't just believe what you think about you and you can't just believe how you feel you have to realize that all of that is stuff in our soul that Satan uses to try and keep us from going forward the Word of God is the only thing that divides soul and spirit it's the only thing that brings that division so I don't care what I think if it doesn't line up with the Word of God then I'm wrong and I don't care what I feel, if it doesn't line up with the Word of God, then what I feel is wrong. And we have to make a decision that we're going to see what God says about us. That's what we're talking about right now. He's got a lot to say about a lot of things, but right now we're talking about what does He say about us. And God says that you have gifts and talents and abilities and that you're capable and that anything he asked you to do that you can do it you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you that you're strong in the Lord and not weak that you're forgiven and on and on and on and on and on but it has to be more than somebody just preaching that to you you have to meditate on that and study that and read it until you believe it and when you can differentiate between who you are in the flesh and who you are in Christ things start to get really 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 good if I see myself in myself then I can't do anything but be afraid because in myself by myself without Christ I have got bushel loads full of problems well knowing God and knowing who we are in him will help us confront and overcome the fears in our lives and I really want to encourage you to do that don't just receive fear and spend all your life being afraid but confront it in the name of Jesus This little boy's name is Wawin, and he's nine years old. And when he was six years old, he'd already been working in the dumps for quite a long time, digging trash out of the dumpster that could be sold for 50 or 60 cents a day. Here in Cambodia's capital, the city of Phnom Penh. When the pastor came to this village and wanted to start a school, his parents would not let him come to school at first because they couldn't afford to lose the money that he was making. But the pastor offered to pay them the same amount of money that he was actually making when he would go to work in the dump 
and then they let him come to school on that basis. Well, after a short period of time, they saw such a change in him that they said, no, you don't have to pay us anymore. We want him to come to school there. So we're hoping to see the same kind of transition in hundreds and hundreds of children's lives. I don't believe that we can look at a tragic situation like this and do nothing. And I believe together we can make a huge difference in a lot of children's lives. Thank you and God bless you. Miss deze kans niet om Joyce Meyer live te zien. Well, I'm really excited about my first ever conference in the Netherlands. Uitdagende voordrachten. Inspirerende muziek van heel Song London. Be part of this life changing event. In Ahoy Rotterdam op zaterdag 9 mei 2015. Tickets zijn verkrijgbaar via onze website joyce-meyer.nl of bij Primera. Well, you certainly don't have to look very hard these days to find things to worry about. If you turn on the news for even five minutes, you can feel like the world is just spinning out of control. That's why I'm so excited about my new devotional, Trusting God Day by Day. These devotions will help you change your focus from your circumstances to the truth that's in God's Word. You know, it's time for us to enter into the peace that God has made available to us where we can enjoy our lives. And that comes only from trusting God day by day. Begin je dag met God met de 365 overdenkingen voor het hele jaar. Bestel het boek God Vertrouwen van dag tot dag nu via onze website joyce-meyer.nl of bel 026 20 22 100.